Welcome back, America. Joe Pickett is back. Every year, the new millennium, C.J. Box, and you can follow C.J. Box at C.J. Box at Twitter and at his website, has produced a wonderful Joe Pickett novel. His latest is Shadows Real, drops on March 8th. I am most curious, though, about if you go to the C.J. Box website, and uh, it's uh, not surprisingly cjbox.net, we find his book signings, which begin in Sun City, Arizona, and Scottsdale, Arizona, on the 7th of March, and then he goes to Tucson, and on his website it says CJ is going to sign books from Friday, March 11th at 8 a.m. to Sunday, March 13th at 5 p.m. So I have no idea what that means, but CJ, is that a stunt or is that a mistake? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a both. Um, it, it's the Tucson Festival of Books. So I'm there on a series of panels, I think four different panels, and there's signings after each one. So it's not nonstop signing, but there's a lot of opportunities to sign books. I thought that might be the longest book signing in history. You might be going for a Guinness thing. That would be a very <laughs> uh, uh, Joe Pickett kind of thing to do because he's wrecked the most trucks, including another one in Shadows Real. I'm, not, I'm giving away a little bit of a spoiler, but that's actually not a spoiler because his trucks don't survive. That's right. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about Shadows Real. First of all, Congratulations. Great read. Got me through a 10-hour delay at oh. LAX uh, last week. So I got to read all of Shadows Real in one sitting. Well, 10 hours in LAX sounds like a, a pretty good definition of hell to me, but I'm glad you read the book and thank you once uh, again. Oh, it's terrific. It's so good. And it's, it's like an old friend coming home for the holidays. And this is a holiday. It's a Thanksgiving book. Have you done Thanksgiving before in any of the Joe Pickett books? I have not, I, but I really wanted to do with this one to really set it in a specific time and um, for the reason of bringing all of Joe Pickett's family home again because um, they've been pretty scattered as they've grown up. The three girls are back. Liv is back. Kestrel's there. Nate is off on an adventure, and I'll come back to that. But first, let me introduce to the audience Geronimo Jones. Now, I don't know what you want to say about Geronimo Jones. Uh, people need to discover. He's in there. Uh, he's not named for anyone, as far as I can tell. I know there are a few name drops in here, right? Uh, like of the course, couple in the bar who are the, uh, the the people that talk to Joe in the bar. What's their name? Oh, geez. All of a sudden, I can't remember. But they're, they are, they are, they're obviously someone who's done a good turn at some point, right? Well, you know, a, a lot of the books, in a lot of the names in all of the books come from fundraisers. Right. Where people bid, you know, your name in a CJ Box book and, and the money goes to charity. And that's why when you ask what are their names, I plug the names in at the very last moment. So I haven't written them throughout. So sometimes I get confused on who is who. But, um, yeah, this, these were some fundraiser winners. I, I love this, by the way. Whenever I see new names dug in there. Now, Judge Hewitt makes no appearances in this book, so he's, he's off on vacation. I also saw an homage to Patrick O'Brien uh, in, in the library scene. Have right. you been waiting years to do that? Yes. Um, yeah, it was fun to, do a, yeah, fun to do a scene in a library. And Joe's among the stacks of books. Um, it's kind of a tense moment, but... Um, yeah, that was fun to do. Yeah. Did you, did you, when did you read O'Brien? I'm just curious. Oh, uh, it was probably about 10 years ago or so. I, I just, I, I bought the books from my dad who was pretty infirm at the time and, um, hadn't read them. But then I, when I would visit him, I, 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 I went and read all the books I gave him and I uh, loved them. Well, David Mamet told me and wrote once that he was the greatest practitioner of male friendship and conversation. And the conversation between Joe and Nate is not unlike that, obviously not seafaring, but I mean, easy, familiar, lots left unsaid, the way that men talk to men. I think so, yeah. It used to be, you know, earlier on in the books, you know, they were sort of getting to know each other. Now they're, they're, they're so familiar with each other that, it, yeah, a lot doesn't even need to be said. Now, I, I, so tell us about Geronimo Jones. Geronimo Jones is, like Nate Romanowski, a uh, kind of outlaw falconer. Um, he lives in Denver, outside of Denver. But there, you know, in my world, um, in the book, world of the books, there's a um, kind of network of um, falconers around the country who um, keep each other informed, who communicate somewhat, although they operate completely on separate tracks. And Geronimo Jones is um, a black falconer. And he kind of patrols downtown Denver 
um, and is in the midst of what while Denver is in the midst of uh, urban riots going on. The uh, like Nate has his big pistol. John Geronimo Jones has a triple barrel shotgun that he's pretty good with, and he and Nate hook up. He's, he's an intimidating a- character. I thought maybe maybe he's written in for the Joe Pickett series down the road. Well, uh, what I'm do work- you think? I'm working on the next book, and Geronimo Jones is coming to visit. Okay. Well, he says that in the book. I'm not surprised. Well, people will have to, now they know that Geronimo Jones survives. They don't know who else survived. You never do. And they'll be shocked in this book. But tell me about the, um, the television series. There are two now. There's the Cassie and there's the Joe series. How do they go? Right. Yeah. Big Sky is on ABC, um, second season. It just, they had a kind of winter hiatus, but they just, uh, just uh, aired an episode Thursday night. Um, it's very popular. It's doing very well. Um, and that's based on the Cassie Duel slash Cody Hoyt characters. And then Joe Pickett um, debuted on a channel um, owned by Charter Spectrum. It's called the Spectrum Original. It debuted in December and became their number one show and um, by far and is going to be moved over to um, Paramount Plus oh. in May. Oh, really? That is very good news. I just finished watching the uh, first season of 1883. And, oh, yeah. Uh, very fine television. People love the West. How is the production going on, Joe Pickett? How do you like it? I love it. I, you know, um, I was able to visit the set. It was in Canada, so it was difficult to get to um, at the time. But I was able to visit the set the last week they were shooting. And um, I, 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 love the, I think they did a great job on casting. I love the showrunners. They're sticking closely to the books. Um, the first season of Joe Pickett is primarily open season, the first book, with a little bit of Winter Kill, the third book, put in. But um, it's very, very authentic to the series and extremely well done. Um, can't, I couldn't be happier. It doesn't always yeah. happen this way. Yeah, that does not always happen. As you know, you've waited a long time. Joe Pickett's been optioned a few times, and we've been waiting for Joe Pickett to catch up to the small screen. And I'm very glad to hear that's going over to Paramount, because that means they may be in for many, many years. Because, I mean, you got 22 seasons, don't you, theoretically? Well, theoretically, I think they're going to do, the plan is to kind of um, do two books per season, not necessarily in the order that they came out, but in ever, whatever works um, best for them. So yeah, they're gonna they're gonna start shooting again here pretty soon. Now the three girls are back for Thanksgiving in uh, the Shadows Real, the new book by C.J. Box in bookstores now available at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. It'll be a number one New York Times bestseller. Everything C.J. does. Uh, are they are they planning on aging the girls up, or are they going to swap them out? No, their plan is to pretty much follow the uh, you know the the narr- the arc of the series. The, the, the little girl actors who are in the show will be one year older in the, in the next season. So, um, you know, conceivably, they could grow up with the show just like in the books. Yeah, just like Harry Potter. The kids grew up in, the, in, the, in the, the seven or eight movies of Harry Potter. It's just very hard to predict what children will look like and act like over the course of a series. So good luck with that. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of, of uh, Shadows Real. Where are three cities profiled here, Denver, Portland, and Seattle. I get the sense you're not really a fan of Portland and Seattle, Chuck Box. Oh, I'm a fan of the cities. Um, I'm not a fan of the uh, uh, riots, Antifa um, activities that, that have been taking place there. And in order to, uh, to research the books, um, I did, in fact, go on my own you know, journey and to Denver, Seattle, and Portland. Um, last summer, uh, into the summer. And while I was in Portland, I was in a downtown hotel and I watched a riot occur on the street in front of me and they, they smashed the, the ground floor windows out of the, the hotel I was in and moved on, not a single cop in sight. Um, so I saw it with my own eyes. And, you know, it, it, I don't want to just sit here and disparage Portland, but da- their downtown area, there's not, a, there's not a window that hasn't been replaced by plywood. Um, and it's, <laughs> you know, encampments on every street. And the first thing I saw when I drove into town, I took a wrong turn, went down an alley and saw a guy on a bike with a ax on his shoulder. I'm not kidding. And so it was unlike, I mean, I love Portland and I've been there many times. It's totally different. Yeah. The, uh, the, I'm doing this from memory. I have no notes because I just read the book. And one of the things that 
Well, let me come back after break and tell you about the exchange with the 911 dispatcher in Portland. Don't go anywhere, America. More C.J. Bach coming up. The new book, uh, Shadows Real, available everywhere in bookstores. It'll be a number one New York Times bestseller. It delivers the goods. It's a Joe Pickett novel. If you're new to the Hugh Hewitt Show, Chuck comes on every year or sometimes twice a year because he does two books a year. We'll find out if he's on that schedule when we return. Don't go anywhere. And so back to my conversation with Chuck Box, the brand new book by C.J. Box is Shadows Real. Uh, I have new audiences every year, Chuck. Uh, and so there are new stations all across the United States. We're up to 475 outlets now. So my question to you is, how do we explain you to people? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, really, it's a phenomenon. Arthur Brooks should study you because you worked hard your whole life. And the last you know, what, 15 years have been wildly successful, but that was preceded by 40 years of really hard work. That's right. Uh, writing novels is kind of my third career in my lifetime. Um, I was involved in uh, tourism promotion for a while, um, had a lot of different jobs, started a company um, where we represented five states overseas. We're still not going years. to Yellowstone. We're still not going to Yellowstone, yeah. <laughs> Been to Yellowstone 180 times without incident. And um, then the, the books took off. And um, so I, you know, I'm doing one a year. Uh, Joe Pickett book, and then every other year there's a Cassie Duell or other standalone book, and luckily they've been extremely well received. That's the best job I could ever ever hope for. You know, Blue Heaven is one of my. It's a standalone, and it's really a terrific Idaho book for people who wanted. I, I still remember that very very well, and the one offs and the series within a series. They're all that's th that's two books every. It's three books every two years. That's the deal, and. Uh, every one of them has been a page turner. How many copies are in print of CJ Box now, Chuck? Oh, you know, it's it's kind of hard to say. Um, I know that in the U.S. it's probably about twenty million, but that also gets it get comp it gets complicated because um, you know there's a, a lot of you know ebook downloads that may not be counted in that and. Um, you know, overseas the books are you know have done very well. They're in twenty seven languages, I think. So to get an actual hard accounting of that is a lot of guesswork. I am curious if the people of Wyoming and Montana hate you or love you, because you've actually made people <laughs> want to go there, but you've actually made people want to go there. So what's the, what's the, the, the reaction to Chuck Box up in Wyoming? You know, it, generally, it's extremely good. I, I'd always wondered what it would be like. Um, I always kind of admired the fact that in the South, they kind of revere their writers, um, you know, in a, in a way that not really done in other parts of the country. But I've, I've discovered that the Mountain West is the same way. Um, you know, the, the percentage of readers in this area that's you know, not, not well populated is huge. And um, it's across all walks of life, too, which is great. Men and women, um, blue collar and white walk, white collar. So um, it couldn't, couldn't have gone better. I, I don't know. I can't ever think of a poor reception somewhere. So I want to go back to that 911 call from the dispatcher in Portland. <laughs> uh, you know, it's going to stick with me. Do you think that really happens? Yes, I do. Um, wow. Based on some conversations that I had while I was in Portland with people like, um, you know, at the hotel, people, you know, who were actually trying to work uh, during, you know, the, the riots and had to show up every day for their job. They were telling me all sorts of stories about responses and non-responses when it came to uh, the violence and the, you know, the riots. And, and while I was there, the, the morning after the when windows got smashed out in the hotel, it was, it was just surreal because it was the first day the Portland mayor came out and said, we must unmask Antifa once and for all. And I thought, dude, you've got a citywide outdoor mask mandate. Yeah. You know, what are you saying? Yeah. And, and this black block stuff, you've done your research on, T on, on Tifa, obviously. By the way, I'm afraid Putin's going to end up using Shadows Real because he's got uh, this denazification propaganda nonsense. And then he's going to say, well, look, it's in Nazis or in C.J. Box's book. <laughs> I don't think he reads them. But, um, yeah, it's the same tactic. It, you, you know, you, um, Antifa, I've read the Antifa handbook. And um, done, read a lot of you know interviews with members and um, a lot of news stories, a lot of research, and that's that's you know everybody thinks they're the good guy and they 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 justify 
the things they do by saying that they're get, going against the Nazis, right. um, even though that there's it, there's absolutely no um, truth in that or any proof in that. But everybody's a Nazi to them. So I, I began the book by looking up whether or not you had invented moose season or not. And and so you were you you didn't you actually I, there are two moose seasons there's the arrow which you know I I know that skill set pretty well but the other yeah. season uh, that so you got it right you had to time it into Thanksgiving so you had to pick seasons that ended right before Thanksgiving right and I have been moose hunting you so I know that there is a moose season did you get did you get a moose I did not but my partner did and that what, was enough what do you Those do with a moose animals. when you get a moose you eat it. Um, first, you <laughs> field dress it, and then uh, then you get it processed. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll come back after the break in the extended conversation with CJ Box. Go out and get Shadows Real America. It's a great diversion from everything going on in the world. It's a great diversion from Putin and Ukraine. It's a great diversion from everything. Give yourself the pleasure of getting to know CJ Box. Begin with open season. I always say that, and just read all twenty-two of them. But if you're already caught up, CJ Box Shadows Real more on the extended broadcast. Stay tuned, America. Welcome back to the interview with Hugh Hewitt. Now, CJ, we're going to get a little bit deeper into Shadows Real, and I want to warn people as they listen to podcasts, they're getting closer to spoilers here. Um, I'm not going to do any spoilers, obviously, but I'm going to intimate a few things that if they don't want to know anything, just go back and listen to it later because it's on the podcast. Viktor Orban is the Hungarian strongman who has... uh, gotten on the wrong side of history, the right side of history, the wrong side. I mean, he's just a self-serving megalomaniac tyrant. Right now he's against Putin. So is Orban in the background here? Not so much Orban um, himself specifically, but um, certainly Hungary. Um, I've been there a couple times over the last few years. I really like Hungarians. I like Hungary. Um, Budapest is one of the beautiful cities I've ever seen. But I've had some conversations with Hungarians and um, you know, it's always fascinating to me that, you know, their take on everything going on there is totally different from than I had heard from the outside. Most of the Hungarians I talked to love him um, for what he's done to them, per, for them personally. But it's also, you know, a lot of politics, a lot of because their history and communism and in some cases kind of Nazism um, is behind them. There's some big shadows across that extremism in their that. blood. I, I, I don't know if that's ever been applied to Orban or not, but it, it's very well done. Now, I got to tell you, I was a skeptic at the end of this, that one of the things for the new listeners, CJ always anchors his book in real stories. So the Antifa stuff is real, and I'm going to come back to Antifa. But the, the scrapbook, I had no, I, I missed it entirely. Did you just see that story come across your desk and say, novel, novel, novel? No, I actually saw the photo album. It was a, a Nazi photo album um, from the number five uh, Nazi in the Nazi government um, who is named Julius Stryker, the worst anti-Semite you can even imagine. Um, that particular photo album was actually donated to a local Wyoming library at the end of a guy's life. And um, the librarian showed it to me, didn't know what to do with it. it was, and it was, it was shocking to see the photos. And um, it's, it's exactly as described in the book, great big leather bound um, photo album with swastikas all over it in silver. Um, and it, it, the, the, uh, the story behind it is that strangely enough, there are two of, two of the, uh, American GIs who were with the Band of Brothers and went all, all across Europe were also the first ones into Hitler's eagle's nest. One of them stole Hitler's photos album, and the other one stole Julius Stryker's and brought it back. You see, I didn't know any of this. And I, I've read Band of Brothers. I didn't read the Majors book. Uh, I've watched the TV series. So I did, and so I thought, where is this coming from? And I look, it's, it's all true. So yeah. CJ, my hat is off to you. I don't know how you come up with this stuff. Year, in, I mean, Antifa is is was waiting for you to descend on it. It was waiting for you to pick it up and use it. And, and uh, uh, falconry has been there forever. And of course, the five we know about them. We know about the whole backstory. But I have never, ever been such a doubter of a CJ Box hook. And it's there. It comes through. There's even a there's even a link in the uh, afterward. If people want to look at the actual photo album, um, it's at the Hoover Institution now. 
um, apparently in a great big vaulted room that has all sorts of memorabilia like that photo album in it. Um, that's where the, the librarian in Wyoming found a repository for it. And the librarian in Wyoming is unnamed because they, he or she does not want to be named, and that's good. So uh, you respect people when they get in touch with you. So, CJ, I haven't told much about anything, but I do want to say, when you drove around Denver, when you've got Nate and Geronimo driving around Denver, I know those streets. I know that area pretty well. I've been to Denver enough. Did sure. you go and drive the route? I'm just curious. Did you drive the actual route and Gum Alley and all that stuff in, in Seattle? Did you go there and see them? I did, yeah. I thought um, so. You know, I didn't, I, I've been to all these places because that's one great thing, you know, book tours afford is, um, you know, city by city. And there's usually a little bit of time to walk around. So I was, I was fairly familiar with the cities, but I did want to go back and um, see what they're like. And, you know, this one of the strangest thing about the antics and stuff is that local and the residents don't want to talk about it. Um, they just want to pretend it's not happening. Um, and it, it's weird, I think. Um, You'd think they'd be alarmed, but they just turn their heads. I, I am amazed uh, that you have so accurately portrayed the typical Antifa member. And it's <laughs> uh, a Boulder graduate. I just want people to know that the CU Boulder makes an appearance as being a, uh, a, a assembly line for Antifa basement dwellers uh, in their parents' <laughs> basement. And I, just, I, was, I, I yucked that up because I have a son who's a CU grad. I'm going to tell him, uh, and, he, and he reads C.J. Box, I'm going to tell him, you're not going to like this book too much, but I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. I mean, the CU people are really kind of insufferable, as you well know. Uh, let, let, let me finish by talking a little bit about uh, what your plan is. What is your plan, Chuck? I mean, you've, you don't have to do another day's work. You could go around and give speeches. You don't have to write Casey Duell novels. And, uh, although, I mean, you don't have to do anything. So why are you doing it? Is Lori behind this? Well, um, not re well, she is sort of because if I'm just hanging around the house, that's I'm what I mean. Mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you get out there to your, your office, you know, get, quit bothering me. No, it's because I like it so much. I mean, um, there's, I, there's nothing that gets me more excited than to get on a topic that I maybe not be that familiar with and research the heck out of it and figure out how it can work into a future novel. I love that. Um, it's my favorite thing is writing the first draft of a novel. From then on, it's work, but uh, the first draft is the most fun. And the research is one of my favorite parts of it, of every one of them. I do it because I like it. Um, and we have long winters in Wyoming, too. <laughs> yeah. So I've got the time. Well, let me give three promises. The MRAP is back. I want people to know that. The MRAP is a, is a fun part of, uh, of CJ Box lore and Joe Pickett lore. Uh, Sheriff Tibbs is back. We saw him before. Don't know how long. Uh, I don't know how you're going to like Sheriff Tibbs. And then we have a new bar. Uh, because honestly, I never thought Saddle String would get a second bar, but the wet fly is there. Yeah. Now, where does that come from? Well, I kind of based it on a, a, on a little bar on the outskirts of the town I live in um, that tends to be kind of a uh, working man, shift work kind of bar. Um, it actually does have an L-shaped pool table in it. That's what I wanted to ask. Else. I wanted to ask, how do you even play pool on an L? I'm not a very good pool player. Uh, I admit I haven't uh, played competitive pool in years. Uh, back in the days of the rankings, it was great. But the L shape, I've never heard of. <laughs> I had neither. I play pool. We have a pool table in our house. We play all the time. It's the most frustrating thing I've ever done. I'm never doing it again. It's, you know, you can imagine the angles and, and trying to hit a pocket around a corner. It's, it's ridiculous. Well, whose idea was, I mean, what's the story behind it? I don't know where they got this thing. Um, there is a little plaque on the wall that explains that there, apparently there are more of these L-shaped pool tables around, but I've never seen another one. Okay, well, the, the, the idea of a shift bar is very familiar to anyone from Warren, Ohio, because uh, the steel mills ran three shifts, GM ran three shifts at the height of that. And a shift bar is no matter what time you get off, you got to go have a beer before you go home and go to bed. That's it, right? That's a shift right. bar. Right. Yeah. You see the people there in the morning who, in, in our case where we live, um, there's a lumber mill. And, uh, you know, they, they may be getting off at six or seven in the morning and they're, they, they go and have a beer before they go to bed. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is Lola. Um, is Lola a name of a, a, a charity auction? 
No, I think I, I made that one up. Okay, well, so Lola is in here, and Lola is old, and uh, so is Bert. There are old people in here, and this is what I like. I really do like this, Chuck. Real life has old people in it, and old people are different from, and by old, I mean 80 and older, uh, not the youthful 65 that some of us might be. Uh, no, I'm talking about, I mean, real life, 66. I got to remember, I'm 66 now. I'm talking about old people who are up at 80, et cetera. So you've got a few old people in this book. Um, and we're used to Missy, but Missy's a different kind of old person. Was that something you intended to do, or was it just useful to the storyline? No, I, it was something I intended to do, um, you know, in, in order to, uh, you know, make it more realistic, um, but also to provide some very sympathetic characters um, that, are, that turn out to be victims by no fault of their own. Um, I thought that would drive home kind of the cruelty of the bad guys. Um, so that's that's the reason. Do you know that I, I had lunch in the last year of the Trump administration? You know, Steve and Christine, who are now up in Alaska. They used to be down in Texas and they were in D.C. Yeah. for a while. Well, one of the big things that Steve introduced me to when he was at Justice was the elder abuse uh, world. And, and DOJ, Democrat or Republican, is throwing more and more resources because in America, older their older people get preyed upon by fraudsters and by violence, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. And, and nobody knows about that. And I think they might think about after they finish Shadow Real checking in on some people more often. I would hope so. Um, you know, in, in pretty remote areas like where I live, there are a lot of those, you know, people who are long, long retired. They live in a single trailer out in the woods somewhere. People don't check on them. Um, and, and during the pandemic, especially it was, it was pretty tragic, I think for a lot of their existences. So, so last, very, very last thing, Chuck, and you've been generous with your time. When you go out and meet people now, can you move without recognition or do you have to put the stats in a way? I mean, do people now see you and know you? Uh, in airports sometimes, yes, not consistently, but, um, I'm always, I'm always shocked when it happens. Um. But it does happen. Uh, do you like it? Oh, I don't mind. Uh, I mean, I put myself out there. But, you know, Hugh, the last couple of years haven't been able to move around much. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, that that's a good point. Did you do a um, a book tour last year? No. No. Oh, and the, interesting. The, and the previous one was cut short because it, it was the last week of it. Yep. Again, on March 14th, 2020, when everything Because I just come back from Hawaii, and I'm just about to go to Hawaii. My, my, so in terms of staying at home for two years uh, up in Wyoming, how did Wyoming, did anyone even notice COVID in Wyoming? <laughs> of course, every, you know, people noticed, but it was totally, it was, I mean, it was like Florida, um, no mask mandates. Um, you know, after the first few months when everybody had it figured out, they just treated it like the flu. Kids were in school, no masks. It, life went on. Um, everybody got COVID at some point, including me, but it just moved on. Um, it, it was not a not a crisis. When I did some traveling this last summer, I was shocked what the rest of the country was like. Oh, the, the Beltway is the epicenter of COVID panic. And so getting away from it to California for a couple of months has been a blessing. And I hope when I go back, uh, Glenn Youngkin has broken the back of it. So, okay, let's get the update. What is next? Shadows Real is out. People are buying it. It'll be a number one New York Times bestseller. I'm sure the numbers will come out next week and prove me right. Because you've got this legion of CJ Box fans who buy Shadows Real uh, just like they do everything else, even though you're a Yellowstone denier. What's next? <laughs> uh, what's next is a new Cassie Duell novel. It will okay. be out in September called Treasure State that I'm really happy with. And then I've already begun the next Joe Pickett novel. I just go to work every day. You know, I, I'm amazed by that, Chuck, and I'm glad. Uh, in terms of Cassie, is that is that needed for the TV show? Do they need, do they need new material? I think they do. Um, uh, they, they are very interested in the, the plot line. Uh, they've kind of burned through all of the books. That's what I mean. Please. Yes, they have. <laughs> so hopefully they will, you know, use this um, narrative. But it's not designed to do that. I don't think of the the actors or the productions when I'm writing. Do Do you feel like um, G George R. R. Martin in Game of Thrones. He just gave up trying to keep up with the showrunners. Is that going to happen? No, um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, I'm not trying to keep up with the showrunners. You know, they're trying to keep up with me. 
So, well, um, you know, if they if they choose to go their own directions, there's not much I can do about it. They can't go their own direction with Paramount Plus. This is the interesting thing. Nate doesn't show up in open season or winter kills, right? No, he does show up in Winter Kill, which is the reason they incorporated that. Oh, the okay. Season. Okay. So that so that, I thought it was the fourth book. He comes no, in the third the, book. Okay. Both so, Nate and Missy are introduced in the third books, which is why they use parts of that in the first season so they would be in the, in the show, which uh, I really urge you to watch. I, oh, I, oh, I'm going to watch every – I can't I can't deal with serial killers, but Joe I can deal with. And I, <laughs> I cannot wait, actually, to sit down and binge watch Joe. I'm so Paramount Plus is, is big time. They, they have the resources to make this happen. Are they partnered with Prime? Uh, you know, not Prime, not Prime yet. But we're seeing. You know, I'm. I keep getting asked where you know where people can see it, and I, I get the information kind of slowly from the uh, producers. But um, I'm really thrilled with the Paramount Plus thing, and I guess there's going to be. So they're going to start running some commercials for it during 1883, um, the show you're watching. So you'll see that. I'm done with it. Uh, I didn't see a, uh, so people who will be watching it now, we finished it last night. And oh, okay. it, it's an epic See, I mean, Wyoming doesn't get very nice press out of it. Montana gets all the good press. Of course. Uh, yes. <laughs> As to be expected. <laughs> the Wyoming Cattle Growers Association comes in for a couple of hits. It's a little bit, a little bit derivative of other things like uh, C.J. Box's original books. CJ, thank you. Congratulations. Be safe out on the road. The Antifa people may even like your book. I don't think they read much, though, do they? I don't think so. I don't think they read much at all. But thank you so much for making time for me during all of all the things that are going on in the world. I really appreciate it. People need to read and get their minds off of stuff. And people, when they travel, you know, the funniest thing that the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt and I noticed, some people get on airplanes without a book and they sit there and they don't hook up the wire, and, and they don't do anything. Their hands are in their lap the whole time. Can you imagine that? I've seen them too, and I wonder what in the heck is going on in their heads. It, it drives me crazy. Uh, it, it really is unfathomable, especially when they've got 22 Joe Pickett books to go and start with. <laughs> CJ, have a great time. Greetings to the whole box clan. Let us know when you're in either the Beltway or, or California. Will do. Thank you so much, Hugh. Thank you. Shadows Real, available now in bookstores.